you really get concerned about COVID-19 because so many people um, don't want to go to the hospitals right now. But we do know that uh, if you're suffering from heart problems, moments count, minutes count, seconds yes. count. And so you need to not hesitate to seek medical assistance. To talk a little bit more about our healthy hearts and a study he's doing over at Beaumont Hospital, let's bring in Dr. David Haynes, a cardiologist. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me today. So uh, have you seen an increase in the number of patients suffering um, from health issues in the middle of the pandemic? Well, I think the major concern, as you just brought up, is that people are delaying getting appropriate acute care because of concerns about COVID exposure in the hospital environment. Now, in that setting, we are very, very careful in terms of separating infected patients from general um, uh, non-COVID patients and everybody in the hospital environment is very attentive to hand washing, using protective equipment. And so in hospital transmission is, I think as low as it possibly can be. Uh, but what is happening is people are delaying appropriate treatment because they don't wanna come in here. And that's a problem. So uh, Dr. Haynes, what are some of the signs an individual should be becoming aware of uh, that should start raising alarm bells for them? Sure, yeah, I think that, you know, anything out of the ordinary, uh, chest pain, shortness of breath are the big two that get our attention, rapid palpitations. Uh, and, you know, there are variations of those symptoms that all of us get sporadically here and there. But if this is something that is out of the ordinary, particularly if it is associated with exertion and then alleviated with rest and it's a new problem, you need to get checked out. So is it better to go to a primary care physician first and let them do an overall assessment? You know, I think that getting in front of a physician wherever that is, is uh, a good first step. If you are acutely ill though, you need to come right into the hospital. If this is just a kind of a nagging problem that's kind of worsening over time, it's appropriate to work up in the outpatient setting and you can start with your primary care physician for that. So uh, tell us more about the study that you are uh, participating in. Well, the study pertains to a particular cardiac condition called atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a rapid irregular rhythm in the upper chambers of the heart and it's very common, most common rhythm out there requiring treatment. It's estimated that over 6 million Americans have this arrhythmia. You may hear story, uh, the ads on TV about the blood thinners, uh, Eliquis and, and Xeralto and the like. Those drugs are specifically designed to prevent some of the complications of atrial fibrillation, specifically the risk of blood clot and stroke. So when a patient is in this irregular rhythm, instead of the heart squeezing in a coordinated fashion, the upper chamber of the atria are sort of uh, wiggling and little eddies and pools of blood can form and can form clot. And if that clot lets loose and ends up in the head, that can cause a major stroke. And in fact, 20% of strokes that occur are associated with atrial fibrillation. So that's a, a big public health concern. But on top of that, a fib is a very symptomatic rhythm for some people. So with that, how much of this is genetic and how much is to lifestyle? Um, mostly the latter, mostly lifestyle. In particular, obesity is a big problem. Um, excess alcohol is associated with atrial fibrillation, but it just happens even in the healthiest of people. Uh, actually, long distance runners have a higher than normal prevalence of AFib. It's thought that the stretch of their heart during exercise may contribute. So it really hits all walks of life. Yes, there is a genetic component. Uh, if you have two parents, 
with AFib, you're about five and a half times more likely to have AFib than the general population. But like I said, it can affect anyone. So if someone is concerned, what is the screening process like? The common symptom that people have are feelings of irregular heart rate. Now, that's really common, and I would say that you know 95% of those people have entirely benign conditions. So if you're feeling occasional palpitations, again, a very common symptom and almost always benign, but some of those patients do have atrial fibrillation. Again, older age, high blood pressure history, any kind of heart condition, predisposes people to this uh, if they have sleep apnea. That's a bad problem and often can trigger atrial fibrillation. But if you have irregular heart rhythm symptoms, your doctor will prescribe a heart monitor. Now, one of the ways that we're finding patients in the modern era, which is uh, amazing to me, is the use of um, uh, the Apple Watch or home pulse monitoring devices, plethysmography devices like the Fitbit watch. And these things have programming that pick up the irregular pattern of AFib and will actually alert patients to the possibility of this rhythm. So now we're seeing patients who may be entirely without symptoms, but they come in and say, hey, my, my watch says I have AFib. And, uh, and we are picking up those patients as well. Technology really is amazing right yeah. now. Yeah, it really is great. And, you know, I honestly, I was a little worried when these things started catching on. I thought my clinic would be overrun with people coming in saying, look what my watch told me that I had. Actually, it's just the opposite. You know, we all feel funny things. We all have anxiety. Is, is there something wrong with my heart? And having the heart monitor right at home allows you to reassure yourself, ah, you know, my heart rhythm is normal. It's okay. I'm okay for today. And so that's actually lessened the, uh, the, the prevalence of worried people with normal hearts who used to come to my clinic, so it's a good thing. Dr. David Haynes with us here on the MegaCast. He is a cardiologist for Beaumont Hospital. What do you hope to learn with this study? Well, so when you have a patient who has enough AFib that it's impeding their lifestyle, or maybe they're just concerned about the potential long-term complications related to AFib, and there are things associated with AFib, including cognitive decline like Alzheimer's, heart failure, even or an increased risk of dying. So people who want aggressive treatment often turn to me and my colleagues, and we do a procedure called catheter ablation. And this is a procedure where we put wires in through the veins up into the heart and we go over to the left atrial chamber and we go into the region of the pulmonary veins, which is the source of probably 90% of the triggers that get AFib going. And in particular, if you've got an otherwise normal heart and you've got bursts of AFib, and particularly if they're symptomatic, this catheter approach where we kind of burn out the source of the AFib is a great option to offer. We've been doing this for a number of years, but I tell people it's a good procedure, it's not a great procedure. It's good because when it works, you're done with AFib. It's not a great procedure because it doesn't work in everybody. And there are a small but some risks associated with it. This new technology that we're using is called pulsed field ablation. It again, uses catheters in the heart, but the way that we affect the tissue uses a different energy form. It uses a very high voltage electrical shock almost, and it actually shocks the tissue, and it kills it off, kills off the area that's causing the problem. And compared to 
the standard approach, which is radio frequency or cryoablation, a couple of different technologies. This appears to be safer, more effective, and faster. It's a win-win-win. And, and of course, we are in the trial to prove these points, but all of the extensive work leading up to this trial has really demonstrated this as being probably a superior technology to what we've been using. So we're excited to be one of the lead centers in the world offering this to our patients. Dr. David Haynes with us here on the Megacast. He's a cardiologist over at Beaumont Hospital. And uh, doctor, if I can ask, is there a typical age range uh, that AFib typically um, will impact certain people, or could this be all over? Well, uh, my youngest patient was actually 17 years old. Wow. That's highly unusual. Um, it's more common in older folks, but the demographic of patients that usually come to my clinic are people you know, in their middle age, in their 50s, maybe 60s, uh, on up into their 80s. We do offer this procedure to older, healthy people. There are a lot of really uh, fit and, um, and healthy 85-year-olds walking around out there that are bothered by the AFib. So we don't consider age as a reason not to offer the procedure. So uh, it does tend to gravitate more to the uh, younger population, though. So if someone is interested in the study, are there certain uh, demographics or dynamics that they must fit in order to be a participant? Well, to participate in the trial, this has to be, they cannot have had a failed prior procedure. And they have to go through the first tier of attempted treatment. And we do have medications that have effectiveness against this rhythm. So if you have seen your doctor, you've had documented arrhythmia, you've tried a drug like uh, flecainide or Rhythmol or Sotalol, one of these drugs that are meant to suppress the AFib and it didn't work or you didn't tolerate it, then absolutely you are a candidate for this trial. It, this really is fascinating, the body and the heart, how it all comes together. Yes. It's such an amazing organ. Um, with the, Have you been able to see more patients or fewer patients? What's been the relationship on the heart from COVID-19 standpoint? We actually did a large study, actually the largest study uh, to date, looking at the uh, changes in the electrical properties of the heart in response to uh, both COVID and, and in particular, uh, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin antibiotic treatment. You may remember the controversy about a year ago when some people were saying this is a great treatment, others were saying uh, it's ineffective. The key thing that bothered us is that it's a potentially dangerous combo in a small subset of patients. So we actually uh, tracked all of the patients coming through our hospital receiving these drugs and looked at their heart rhythms and their EKGs every day. My fellows, the team that did this was fantastic. Um, we were, uh, first of all, not surprised to see significant EKG changes, but we were uh, elite, uh, alleviated that, that there was no high-grade rhythm problem associated with the use of these drugs or with COVID. And that's a surprise because COVID is such a devastating disease. Um, but uh, it really hits the lungs really hard. And of course, people with pre-existing cardiac conditions, that's a big stress. But the cardiac aspects of the disease seem to be more secondary to the lung aspects of the disease. Now, what we don't know, what we, and, and we're all concerned about is, will be, there be late manifestations of the disease that affect the heart? That is to say, patient had COVID, got sick, got better, went home. Are they gonna show up in a year or 10 years with new 
changes to the heart muscle or to the arteries to the heart that may have been uh, 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 induced with the COVID infection. So we're, we're learning new things every single day about, about this infection. We're talking with Dr. David Haynes with us here on the Megacast. He's a cardiologist at Beaumont. Uh, doctor, uh, just another minute or two with you here on the show. Before we say goodbye, anything you want to share with the listeners and viewers that maybe we didn't ask you because you are the expert? Well, you know, uh, of course, I spend my, a lot of my time working with heart rhythm patients and and in that regard, atrial fibrillation patients. And everybody wants to know how to treat it, but what we really want to know is how do you prevent it in the first place? It would be best. And you know, there may be a day where I'm out of business because there are no AFib patients out there. That would be the best. So what can you do? Uh, and it gets boring, but it's the usual stuff. The heart healthy lifestyle that's got tremendous effect in terms of preventing uh, a number of heart diseases, including atrial fibrillation. And with the obesity epidemic, that's really sent the AFib numbers through the roof because fat, actually fat accumulates around the heart and actually has a direct irritating effect on the heart and can cause the arrhythmia. So keeping your weight in check, trying to get down to ideal body weight and that helps high blood pressure, which reduces arrhythmia risk and cardiac disease overall, reduces diabetes risk, and that helps across the board. So, you know, normal uh, cardiac recommendations of a heart healthy diet, low carbohydrate, regular aerobic exercise, these are all critically important to arrhythmia prevention and general cardiac health. Is this a condition that someone can live with and manage? Yeah. Oh, we, I mean, we have many, many, many patients who um, conventional treatments don't work. They don't want to do the ablation. And um, so we leave them in AFib. And some of them, uh, many, many of them are completely asymptomatic. And so long as they take their blood thinner and they're protected against stroke, they live happy, fulfilled lives without difficulty. But um, there are some patients who do get into trouble uh, after years with atrial fibrillation still. And the really big uh, thing for everyone out there is do not delay getting medical help. Right, absolutely. Dr. Haynes, we so appreciate your time. Okay, well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed talking with you today. So uh, when do you expect to have the results of the study? Well, we have just started the pivotal phase. Uh, 400 patients need to be enrolled around the world. I anticipate we'll get through that group in about uh, three or four months. And then we've got a year of follow-up before we analyze the data. So we're talking a couple of years before we get the final answer, but we're, uh, we're looking forward to that. Well, good luck with the study, and thank you again for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Okay, my pleasure.